By the way, my two-year-old daughter, she listens to him. She gets excited when huh, we come close to the video. She gets very excited. Tafadhali, Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولقد آتينا داود وسليمان علما وقال الحمد لله الذي فضلنا على كثير من عباده المؤمنين وورث سليمان داود وقال يا أيها الناس علمنا منطق الطير وأوتينا من كل شيء إن هذا لهو الفضل المبين وحشر لسليمان جنوده من الجن والإنس والطير فهم يوزعون حتى إذا أتوا على واد النمل قالت نملة يا أيها النمل ادْخُلُوا مساكنكم لا يحضمنكم سليمان وجنوده وهم لا يشعرون فتبسم ضاحكا من قولها وقال رب أوزعني أن أشكر نعمتك التي أنعمت علي أنعمت علي وعلى والدي وأن أعمل صالحا ترضاه ترضاه وأصلح لي برحمتك في عبادك الصالحين ما شاء الله بارك الله فيك my dear brother, may Allah Azza make you from the people of the Quran Amen. and may Allah Azza give us all the inspiration to be from the people of the Quran and connect Amen. us to his book. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wala. Firstly, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want it before we start in today's topic, just kind of recap a little bit why we actually presented this opportunity of hot topics and the opportunity for people to ask and answer their questions. Asking questions is a huge element of knowledge. As a matter of fact, Imam Al-Zuhri, rahmatullahi alayhi, said, Al-ilmu khaza'in wa taftahuha al-masail. The ilm and knowledge is storage units almost, and they are unlocked by asking questions. And Imam Al-Hafid ibn Hajar rahmatullahi alayhi said, Al-ilmu su'alun wa jawab. Knowledge is asking and getting the answer. And Ibn Abbas, when someone, radiallahu an, when someone asked him, he said to him, how have you attained knowledge? He said, by two things. Bilisan in sa'ul wa qalbin aqul. That by a tongue that asks and is persistent in asking. And then the second thing, by a heart that is accepting and understanding of that which is being asked. And the scholars detailed and spoke about the etiquette of how you should ask questions, what questions you should prioritize. And from it is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. He said that it's about the importance of asking questions that are relevant. إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِعَبْدٍ خَيْرًا سَدَّدَهُ وَجَعَلَ سُؤَالَهُ عَمَّا يَعْنِيهِ That if Allah Azza wa wants good for a servant of his, he guides him to ask the questions that are relevant to him. Rather than يعني, مثلا, someone that's a brother facing issues that are related to brothers, asking about the rulings of hijab, and he doesn't have any mah- mahram that he relates to them, just out of curiosity, and forgetting that which is important. So there's also, in terms of starting by asking that which is important to you and yourself, and what is relevant to you. And um, also one of the etiquettes of asking is uh, appreciating those that you ask, and also choosing your word and asking, and asking in the best manner. And one of the imma Maymun ibn Mahran, he said, husnul mas'ala nisfu su'al. The way you ask and your question being good is half the question. And the way it's worded is being good. So this was the opportunity and this is why we actually went with, we could have decided to do any series, anything that is going to get people in, in terms of the day of judgment and these sort of things. But we wanted something that's an opportunity for people to ask and answer their questions. And alhamdulillah, so many questions come on a weekly basis. And there's only so many that we can select and go through. 
and it's a limited time that we have with our mashayikh and we appreciate all of the time that we have with them and alhamdulillah today we have our first returning guest to the hot topics al ustad abu taymiyah hafizahullah assalamu alaykum wa sheikh wa ahlan wa sahlan bik wa barakatuh before ustad ubaid starts throwing the questions i just want to say the following the fact that we have so many brothers uncles elders all attending the masjid while the world cup game is going on it is something that is worth mentioning may allah azza wa jal bless every single one of you um, we know that the shabab especially are obsessed with football so for you to sacrifice messi and his argentina to come to the masjid it's indeed something that should be commended may allah azza wa jal bless you all um, right i've been giving small little reminders at the masajid even in makki masjid today after the juma i decided to grab the mic to remind them of the following i don't want to go into because i know one of the questions he wants to ask me is what is the ruling on watching football i'm not going to answer that right i don't want to go into the ruling itself however one thing that we all agree on my brothers and my sisters is the following when the world cup game is going on and then the time of the salah kicks in Uh, it's a difficult one, huh? Or is it really difficult? Right? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. What does that mean? Allah is the greatest. Allah Azza wa is the greatest. When you continue to watch that game, and you know you should be attending the masjid, every day you pray in the masjid, right? But you choose to continue watching Neymar, or Mbappe, or Cain. Sahih. I know brothers, I'm very well up to date with what happens in the world. I'm not outdated. Uh, you choose to watch these disbelievers. Even though you're not going to say with your tongue that Neymar is greater than Allah, what are you actually saying with your limbs? Let's be honest here. Hal, with your limbs that you're saying that, let me continue watching you Allah keep waiting. Let me finish, and then I'm going to come to you later. Agreed, brothers and sisters? When you hear, Hayya ala salah, or Hayya ala falah, right? Hasten to success, right? The interaction with your Lord. Can Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you call the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would say, right? In ahadakum idha qama fi salatih, fa innahu yunaji rabbah. Right? When one now stands up in prayer, he's interacting with his Lord, sahih? He is interacting with his Lord. It's an interview between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. When you go for a work interview, let's be honest, brother, and says, you go suited and booted. Looking absolutely slick. If you normally don't have a shower, right? You're going to have a shower that morning, sahih? Looking absolutely slick. Your hair, ah, Shah Khan, right? You're going to make sure that you look very, very good. You're rehearsing how to respond to the questions that the interviewer will most likely ask you. You're focused and concentrating, sahih? Hmm. This is the meeting with your Lord, my brothers and my sisters, that you are putting on hold, sahih? Let that sink in for a moment, my brothers and my sisters. And I'm sure... A lot of us, we are better than that. And the fact that we all chose to sacrifice Messi in Argentina. They are playing against the Netherlands. I'm from the Netherlands. And I can see a lot of you guys are from the Netherlands as well. Especially if you're from Somalia. Sahih. A lot of Somalis, they come from the Netherlands to the UK. And it's hard. But you're sitting here. Even though you didn't have to sit. You could have gone straight after the Salah. Right? That clearly shows that there's a lot of goodness in all of your hearts. And I ask Allah Azza to bless you all. I mean. So bear that in mind, inshallah ta'ala, next couple of games is bound to get even more interesting. Semi-final, and then the final. Right? Bear that in mind. Allah yifadhukum. Amen. Tfaddal. Barakallahu feek. Um, inshallah, I'm going to get straight into it. Um, one of the things that we've seen as a rising trend amongst young people, and amongst just generally the UK, is vaping, vape pens. Uh, this is something that I've been wanting and to ask various speakers about and one of our speakers actually gave his take But I wanted to have, hear from you as well 
the film, mashallah, you're much more connected to the youth and see and understand. And I'm sure you've seen the rise in the number of youth that use it. There are reports of kids as young as seven and eight being addicted to these things and using them in primary schools. What is the ruling in, on vaping? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salli wa sallim ala al-mab'uthi rahmatin al-alameen ba'athahu Allahu shahidan wa mbashiran wa nadheera wa da'ayinan Allah bi'idhni wa sirajan munira I should have said that before but I was itching to speak about football Wallahi brothers and sisters the new pandemic right is this issue of vaping not so long ago I did a program and I was absolutely flabbergasted shocked to the core in Masjid Furqan, Leicester, right? They had their monthly sleepover, and I happened to be in Leicester. And alhamdulillah, you know, it was a beautiful opportunity to, for once, you know, engage with the youth over there. Because normally every Friday I'm giving a khutbah somewhere around the country, but that week I was in Leicester, and it happened to be on the same night when they were sleeping over. So we had a session, and I was absolutely shocked. Oh, parents, please... Give a moment out to uh, really ponder about what I'm about to say. One of the kids, you know what he said to me? He said 95% of kids in year seven, they are what? Doing the vaping. Allahu alam whether the figures are actually accurate or not. But when I asked the rest of the students who were there, is that true? They were like, yes. You know, sometimes you ask someone a question and he thinks like that. No, they were all like, yes, 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 yes. Sahih. Everyone is doing it. This was their response. They've even become extremely creative in how they hide the vapes. They would put it, you know, when you have a hoodie and you have that, what do you call it? A string? They would put it inside there. So they could smuggle it into the schools. They're not smuggling drugs into prisons. La. Smuggling the vape into the schools. Also now it's being smuggled through pencil cases. Excuse me youngsters, you might think that I'm exposing your plots and uh, I don't know, maybe the teacher when they hear this video they're going to check your pencil cases. But this is exactly what's happening, brothers and sisters. Right? It has become the new pandemic. A lot of them, they use these vapes because it's become a new trend. Everyone is doing it. Let's do it as well. Seems pretty cool, right? Mm. So for the last week or so, I was trying to really figure out some practical steps because a youngster is asking me, how can I advise my friend? He's in year seven and he's constantly messaging me on Instagram. Did you find the answer? Did you find the answer? Did you find the answer? What can he do? These are the following solutions that I could maybe, inshallah ta'ala, suggest. Right? Number one, brothers and sisters. Right? Stop hanging around with these people who use these vapes. Cut yourself off completely from these individuals. Because you are on the religion of your friends. He's doing it, or because it's cool, let me go and do it as well. Right? You have to identify the root cause as to why you may be doing a certain act. And a lot of the time, it is because everyone else is doing it. Right? Be a leader, stop being a follower, brothers and sisters. We are in need of leaders. Right? We are in need of those who set trends, positive ones. Not people who are just like sheep. Oh, he's doing it, let me go do it as well. And when you're someone, my brothers and my sisters, who sets a positive trend, you will be respected in the eyes of the people, Muslim and non-Muslim. As opposed to someone who's just like a sheep, he does it, I'm going to go do it as well. You know, a hadith comes to mind. When one is placed inside of the grave, right? إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ إِذَا وُضِعَ فِي قَبْرِهِ وَتَوَلَّ عَنْهُ أَصْحَابُهُ وَإِنَّهُ لَيَسْمَعُ قَرْعَنِ عَالِهِمْ after you are placed inside of the grave. And those who dropped you off have now left. You will hear their footsteps walking away. 
Two angels will come to that individual and they sit him down. فَيَقُولَانِ لَهُ And they will say to him مَا كُنْتَ تَقُولَ فِي هَذَا رَجُلْ What did you used to say about this man? Meaning the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know what his response would be? سَمِعْتُ النَّاسَ يَقُولُونَ شَيْئًا فَقُلْتُ I heard the people say something so I said it as well. Right? I heard the people say it so I said it as well. Whatever the people were saying. You know what's going to happen? Right? An iron hammer is brought فَيُضْرَبُ بِمِطْرَقَةٍ مِنْ حَدِيدٍ In between his eyes smashed فَيَصِيحُ صَيْحَةً Right? He will scream. Everything will hear it. Except الثقلين The jinn and names. You can clearly hear, see my brothers and my sisters that everyone was doing so I done it as well. And look where it got him. Right? What I strongly advise my brothers and my sisters who may be trying their utmost best to stop this vaping is to sincerely make dua to Allah Azza wa from the bottom of your hearts. You know Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi in his kitab al dawa wa dawa the spiritual sickness and the cure he says ad-du'a min anfa'il adwiyah Oh, wa min anfa'il adwiyati ad-du'a From the most beneficial of cures is what? Ad-du'a Sometimes we look at the concept of du'a Wallahi, yeah, inshallah mm. And when he makes du'a, it's half-hearted His heart is not there No, my brothers and my sisters When you do it from the bottom of your heart And you have conviction in Allah Azza wa Jal That he's going to respond to you He will respond to you Right? Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us in a hadith, right? Hadith Salman al-Farisi, I believe it was. Inna rabbakum hayyun kareemun yistahi min abdih. Ida rafa'a yadayhi ilayhi an yarudduhuma sifra. Allah is too shy. And he's too generous that when you raise your hands up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he sends you back empty-handed. Ad-du'a, brothers and sisters. I can say with hands on heart that dua changed my life. And I really, really want you guys to take this opportunity as well. If you're not someone who's making dua, then what I can say is that you are missing out. Of course, there are points that prevent your dua from being accepted, right? That should be taken into consideration. If you want an accepted dua, Ibn al Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi couldn't have put it any better. I've explained it on my YouTube channel, it's called The Spiritual Sickness and the Cure Part 1. I took that passage from a da'wah dua and I just explained it. How to get your dua accepted, brothers and sisters. That's what number two, right? Number three, my brothers and my sisters. If you can wake up in the last third of the night. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Alaykum bi qiyam al-layl fa'innahu da'bu salihina min qablikum. Upon you is the night prayer. Indeed, this is the way of the righteous before you. What does he also do? It removes, right, sicknesses. Whether they are physical sicknesses or spiritual sicknesses. Many of those who are messaging in, right, they have now become addicted. He doesn't want to do it anymore. It feels like now it's become what? Something part of him and it's killing him. He doesn't want it anymore. It all started as a cool trend. Everyone's doing it. Let's go and do it as well. Up until he became addicted. You know what's so shocking, my brothers and my sisters, I came across these stats, which I want to share with you guys, inshallah ta'ala. There was a survey that was done. It's called the Truth Initiative Survey. Right? Which showed a link between quitting nicotine containing e-cigarettes and improved mental health outcomes. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, I've never seen from the time I started giving da'wah up until now, uh, a rise in mental health as it is at this moment in time. It's gone through the roof. Mental health. Every other person that you meet, he's saying that I'm suffering from mental health. Right? These are the kuffar who are saying what? Huh? That there is a link between the two. The sharia tells you anything that harms you is haram. And without a shadow of a doubt, this is harming a lot of people. 
Now look at the connection, right? They said 90% of those who quit said they felt less stressed, anxious, or depressed. 90%. 47% of respondents who quit vaping, vaping reported that when they quit vaping, they felt more in control. What are some of the other practical solutions? I think we're on number four, right? Reach out for help. Reach out for help, my brothers and my sisters. When you fall sick, right? What is the, uh, the common thing to be doing? You'd go to the GP, right? Oh, I've got this ailment, I've got this sickness, please help me out. This is also a sickness and you need to reach out for help, right? It may well be that you have to speak to some of your relatives to help you through this journey. Right. And I ask parents who are here to be a bit understanding. All the kids are doing it. What are we going to do? Are we going to kick them out of the house? Let's be a support system. If this is the child who is now actually suffering from this addiction. Also join a quit vaping program. Right, there are programs. You Google it, you may come across some programs that inshallah ta'ala will be extremely, extremely beneficial. Right? Join it. There's nothing taboo about it. We are sick, let's find the solution for it. It's one thing, my brothers and my sisters, identifying the problem is another, finding a solution. First, you have to accept I am sick. Right? Stop being in denial. I need to do something about it. Are you going to wait till you become mentally disturbed? Later on down the line, it begins to affect your personal life. It begins to affect your marriage, your relationship with people. Is that what you really want, my brothers and my sisters? I've seen enough people like that. And a lot of the time, the root cause for it was, like we said, doing things that are harmful to your body. And it has consequences, whether it may be weed, which has consequences long term, right? Alcohol. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless you all. Amen. Amen. So we're moving on a different direction. Allah, like now that we're in the winter. Time is finishing, huh? Hey, tfadal. Last time, I think we were here for one hour, 20 minutes. And if, if you guys are lucky, you'll probably make it to the penalty shootout if it makes it to there. So until then, we're here. <laughs> Um, as, as, as well, bless you guys, brothers I, 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 and sisters I who have also attended sisters as well. I don't know if they watch football, but <laughs> right. I honestly thought nobody was going to attend. Even the other day when I gave a lecture in Derby, first time I've been there in maybe what over six years, the masjid was packed all the way till the back. Youngsters, they told me we've never seen this many youngsters in the masjid, and it was at the same time when Argentina was playing as well, right. So the fact that we see so many youngsters and brothers and sisters attending these programs, it clearly you know, shows us that there's still a lot of khair in the ummah, in our youth. May Allah bless you all. Mm -hmm. uh. Do you have something yani, against Argentina that you keep <laughs> scheduling your talks at the same time? <laughs> I'm saying just with regards to now winter and salawat time are so close together, it becomes difficult to pray in the workplace. And some people generally find it difficult to pray in the workplace. Is there any advice, any nasiha for that to how to overcome that almost the fear of praying in a working environment? And the fear of being judged? People's reasons differ. Some people just prefer not to even have that confrontation. But I think it's just that environment that a lot of people are working nine to five in an office. And now if you if you were to look at it, Dhuhr, Asr and Maghrib fall into that time space. So when it comes to praying in the work environment, uh, you find people sometimes try to find ways around They say, oh, I can combine Dhuhr and Asr in the winter Or potentially I can stretch Maghrib time till I make it home um, So generally, is it, yani, obviously the fard is always going to be a This question was actually asked to me as I was walking out the Masjid Maghrib time One of the brothers who um, works as a delivery driver Same question he was asking my brothers and my sisters, we have to understand that we were created for one sole purpose. What is that one purpose? To worship Allah Azza wa Jal. I was not created to go to university, not that I'm saying you can't go to university. I was not created to 
work in the corporate world, not that I have anything against anyone working in the corporate world, or as a delivery driver, or someone who works in the warehouse. No, you have to, of course, work in order to provide for your family. Right? But that's not what we were created for. I hope you guys see the difference in what I'm saying. Our sole reason of existence is none other than worship. That's number one. When I wake up, the first thing on my mind is, how can I fulfill my sole reason of existence? Which is what? Ibadatullah. To worship Allah Azza wa and to please Him. He is my master and I'm His servant. And when you have that kind of mentality, my brothers and my sisters, bear this in mind. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, نعم. من كانت الدنيا همه فرق الله عليه أمره وجعل فقره بين عينيه ولم يأتي من الدنيا إلا ما كتب له Whoever makes the dunya his main priority Allah Azza wa Jal will make his affairs fall apart Yes, Allah Azza wa Jal will make his affairs fall apart Constant issues وجعل فقره بين عينيه Allah Azza wa will place poverty in between his eyes it could be that you end up just living in this box life where you constantly keep losing whatever you're making. Or my brothers and my sisters, another type of faqr, poverty of the heart, where you become empty, right? There's never ending box life that just keeps going in circles and circles and circles and I don't seem to be getting anywhere in life. And the only thing that you're going to get from the dunya is what was written down for you. But look at this other person who has tweaked his mentality and his thought process about life in general. He says, وَمَنْ كَانَتِ الْآخِرَةُ نِيَّتَهُ جَمَعَ اللَّهُ لَوْ أَمْرَهُ وَجَعَلَ غِنَاءُ فِي قَلْبِهُ وَأَتَتْهُ الدُّنْيَا وَهِيَ رَاغِمَةُ Or dunya. Huh? Whoever makes the hereafter his main priority, his main focus. He wakes up. First thing on his mind is, what can I do now to get closer to Allah Azza wa Jal? That doesn't mean that you're going to forsake your responsibilities and your duties as a father. Right? No, I'm not saying that. There's no harm taking from the dunya that which is going to aid and assist you hereafter. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But when you just tweak the way you think, your thought process, Allah Azza wa Jal will take care of everything for him. جَمَعَ اللَّهُ لَوْ أَمْرَهُ and Allah will place richness in his heart. The dunya will be dragged to him. The dunya will be dragged to you. Things will come your way, which wasn't even expected. Where did this come from? Subhanallah. And most importantly, you have that richness. Right? You have that contentment in your heart, which can't be bought with money. Many people that I speak to, my brothers and my sisters that are working nine to five, they are all complaining about the same thing. He says, make dua for me. Wallahi, I feel, I feel like this. And he's doing this with his hand, meaning I'm empty. This box life, every day doing the exact same thing. Right? And then subhanAllah, it's not rocket science to actually realize what the problem is. It's not rocket science. He is lacking in his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. So now that we understand my brothers That my sole reason of existence Is what Allah To worship Him And that if I do the right thing right, Then the dunya will be dragged to me We wouldn't hesitate When it comes to fulfilling Our sole reason of existence Which is time of the prayer I have to go and fulfill my duties Right and let me put it this way, and I'm someone who's worked in the corporate world. You guys will be surprised some of the job roles that I've had in the past. Right? When you respect yourself by requesting a place to pray or a time to pray, a lot of the time they will respect you. Right? As opposed to someone who just what conforms to what people say. Right? People will respect you. The boss may well respect you. You'll be surprised, my brothers and my sisters, some of the rights that we have as workers. Did you know, my brothers and my sisters, they go out for a cigarette break every five minutes. Every five minutes, right, they go out for a cigarette break. Do you guys see that work? They are entitled legally for a cigarette break every now and again. And what, you're not entitled to your prayer? When you dig deep, 
huh? and you do some research, he'll come out with some rights that you are oblivious of. Do your research. Um, Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us, "Inna salat kanat ala al-mu'minina kitab al-mawquta." All the salawat have been given its prescribed time. <coughs> Fajr time has its time. Zuhr has a beginning time, and it also has what? An end time. You can pray in between that time. No one is saying that you have to pray at the beginning time, even though it is better. It's flexible in that sense, but it has to be carried out in that time. Delaying the salawat, my brothers and my sisters, to outside of its appointed time is from the major sins. It's actually from the major sins. Right? So we have to be praying at its appointed time. Bear that in mind, brothers and sisters. Right? And that's my number one priority as I was created for that. And when you play around with the salah, my brothers and my sisters, expect everything else to go downhill. May Allah bless you all. Ameen. When it comes to salah, for someone that doesn't pray, how do they practically start praying and, and start uh, sort of fulfilling the five daily prayers at that time because I see some stuff <coughs> online mm. and, and you, sometimes you find like people give their own experiences and generalize it as advice. I saw someone on Twitter saying, Start by one salah, and once you're comfortable, then add another salah. But uh, Islam's got يعني, five salawat, you can't just pick and choose when you're going to pray what. Well, I, I strongly suggest that you come to the masjid. When you see people doing a certain act, it becomes a lot lighter on the nafs. Would you guys agree with that? Look at the month of Ramadan, right? And outside the month of Ramadan. In the month of Ramadan, do most of us have any difficulties fasting? Everyone is doing it, it's a hype, right? You fast. But then when you have to make up a fast outside the month of Ramadan, can you see how much of a burden it is because you're by yourself? So when you do ibadat collectively, it really is a lot lighter on the soul. Also, when you look at the hadith of the one who killed 99, famous hadith, you guys accustomed with it. What did the scholar say to him? This is after he found a monk. He killed the monk because the monk said to him, oh no, there's no way to, for you to be repent, forgiven. So he killed him as well. And then eventually he ended up at a scholar. The scholar said to him, Intaliq ila ardi kada wa kada. Fa inna biha. Go to that land. There is a group of people in that land who worship Allah, worship Allah with them. Being around that system really, really help. So come to the masjid. Do you see at the time of the salah anyone just sitting around doing their own thing? Like people get up and they pray. Right? That's something that I can suggest. Male and female. Right? You see the women. They're going to be at the masjid as well, especially on Fridays. Worship Allah Azza wa Jal with them. No. Sakla khair. Um, a sister is asking, what should she do if her husband isn't praying and is not fasting and is basically not fulfilling the faraid? Uh, what should the sister's position be? What should she do? So the husband doesn't pray? No. Does she have any kids with him? She didn't specify, but we can we can go back and find that. You guys know Sheikh Abdul Basit? Huh? From Leicester? We was actually speaking about this yesterday. And I didn't know that he was gonna ask this question. We was having a discussion yesterday, and um, I don't know whether the Sheikh um, is going to be okay with me mentioning his name, but I like Kulihal, my brothers and my sisters. We need to understand that a salah is not like the rest of the obligations. Leaving of the salah is not like leaving of fasting or hijab. And you know the companions, if they saw a, a sister not wearing the hijab, they said, oh, maybe she's new to Islam. That has no done. Someone's not fasting, oh, maybe sick. Someone not going out for hajj, or oh, maybe he's poor, doesn't have the capability, not paying zakat, incapable. Huh? But when he came to the salah, there was no excuses. And that is because, as the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, huh? I'm not saying this, by the way. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this. The difference between us and them is the salah. Who's them? The agnostic, the atheist, right? <coughs> the Hindu, the Buddhist, and 
the Jew and the Christian, the difference between us and them is a salah. Whoever leaves it off, he has committed kufr. Right? No way. No way. A brother who comes and asks for my daughter's hand in marriage, am I going to even entertain or consider him if this guy is not praying? Imam Ahmed rahmatullahi alayhi saw no different between Muhammad who doesn't pray and John, the non-Muslim, who's a Christian. No difference between them. Or you know Charlotte? Charlotte, the non-Muslim. I have to specify because last time around I said something like this. The video went viral and people are commenting, oh, I'm a revert. My name is Mark. And then you said Mark. No, I'm not speaking about the revert. I'm speaking about a non-Muslim. Charlotte, Jane, John, and uh, Craig. There's no difference between them and also Muhammad, Khadija, Fatima that don't pray. Imam Ahmed saw them no different. So how am I even going to consider? Sometimes you hear parents saying, oh Allah, he will pray later. Inshallah ta'ala, ilah is huh? Allah will guide him. But when he's an alcoholic, you shut your door. Which one is worse? Leaving off the prayer or being an alcoholic? Akhi, the sin of leaving on the salah is far worse, brothers and sisters. Right? If you die upon alcohol and you have to hid, right? You are under the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. Right? You are under the will, under his Mashia. Allah may forgive him, Allah may decide to punish him. Right? However, when it comes to the salah, you're messing around with kufr, brothers, you're flirting with it. Some scholars, they behold that this guy, you can't even marry him off. Khalas, this guy is a wagal. He's a disbeliever. Right? And because of this hadith, also in the Prophet says, Inna bayna shirki wal kufri tark as salah. Between shirk and kufr is what? Leaving of the salah. Prophet said this. Abdullah ibn Shaqiq al Uqayli said, Kanu la yarona shayan min al amali tark wa kufran ghair as salah. They never used to see the companions he's talking about, right? Abandoning anything to be an act of kufr other than the salah. Salah is not a lie, matter, my brothers and my sisters. Extremely, extremely dangerous, if that makes sense, right? So when it comes to this matter now, I'm not giving a fatwa. Let's make that very, very clear. A lot of these issues require a discussion with both parties involved. Let me make that very clear. No one walked into this masjid and I said, or quotes me and says, oh, he said, kada wa kada. I didn't say anything, right? You would have to sit with both the spouses, both the husband and the wife, and you need to do ta'akkud, tahabbud. Sometimes a sister who wants to get married, she says, oh, my father cannot be the guardian because he doesn't pray. MashaAllah. Or he's a fasiq because he watches Al Jazeera. Huh? He's a transgressor. All these kind of things that are mentioned huh, by sisters from time to time. May Allah Azza wa forgive them just so they could overstep the guardian. No, you need to do ta'akkud in all of these cases that I'm speaking about. Is that really the case? They need to sit in front of a judge. Qadar Rasulullah anna al-khasmayni yaqudani bayni day al-hakim as Abdullah ibn Zubayr said. The Prophet judged, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that both the defendant and the claimant, they have to sit in front of the judge. Go sit next to, or in front of Sheikh Muhammad Ali. Or you have uh, Sheikh Hafiz al-Rahman from Makki Masjid, who is part of the uh, Sharia Council. Go sit down before you request a separation, right? This is after long periods of advice, you've tried, you made dua, this, that, and then it reaches a breaking point, something needs to be done. Um, speak to these people inshallah ta'ala, but this is a very, very serious matter, leaving of the salah. It's not even something that is up for discussion. May Allah Azza wa Jal guide the Muslims. Amen. We live in a day and age. I think the phrase parenting by iPad has been coined and there's even the marketing strategies, iPad for parents and kids to go together. So I think you see a lot of parents, sometimes it could be labeled lazy parenting, could be just a cop out where they give their kids the iPad and it's YouTube all day and let the child sit on the iPad. Is there any advice that you have for? You know, brother and sister, in today's day and age, the child has three parents. The father, the mother, and also the iPad or the phone. Three parents. The mother and the father are no longer educating the child. 
because they've become addicted to the phone, huh, take the iPad, leave me alone. صحيح? And then from the age of maybe what, one and a half, two years, two and a half, three years, huh? they become devout to this iPad that teaches them so much. Wallahi al-Azim, my brothers and my sisters. Kids as young as one year and what, six months, seven months, right? They know how to use the iPad. They'll go onto Instagram, they'll click on this. They don't even know what to press, what they want to actually really do. They know what to do, right? And then they become exposed to all of this from that age. Kids as young as that, my brothers and my sisters, did you know that they pray? Put your hand up if you've seen a one and a half year old child praying. Not, of course, walking into the masjid and praying. You guys know what I'm talking about. Huh? Have you guys seen a one and a half year old praying? And I shoved. Wallahi al I see it. Why? Why does the child start praying? Who can tell me? Because he sees the parents praying. I always lo- I love using this proverb. It's a Somali one. Huh? Wherever the camel goes, you find that huh? the children go the exact same direction. The only thing that a child sees throughout the day is who, at that age, none other than the parents. So if the parents are behaving a certain way, what do you expect from a child? Don't expect any difference. Right? Screen time needs to be limited as much as we can, brothers and sisters. Right? Someone may say now, but oh, the kid starts crying when I take the phone. For how long does he cry? What? Two minutes? Three minutes? When you give the child time and you start playing with it, you take a book, you'll see it behaving very differently. But when he gets used to the iPad, that's all he wants. It's as simple as that. Today, parents, you hear them saying that this is like, oh, it's a must. Billahi alayk, before the iPads came along, how were the kids living their lives? Or these toddlers, how were they functioning? Right? Sometimes, again, we're in denial. We tell ourselves that this is the only way. How were the children living before the iPads? Let's ask ourselves the question. How? So make sure you take it off them. Even when it comes to the IQ level, it affects it. Their brain cells. Constantly in front of that bright light. There's research that has been done on all these things. And now what did you say they have? They've got both the parent and the child, they can buy it together. Yeah. Buy one, get one half price, huh? Sakla khair. I think just sticking on the topic of uh, technology and uh, iPads, phones and that sort of thing, and maybe just taking it more to uh, the older crowd and it's marriage apps. Do you have Islamic matrimonial apps you have all sorts of... Uh, like Tinder. And Muzmatch, huh? Muzmatch. What's the other one called? There's another one now as well. Some, brother said, like don't some brother said that very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> don't act like you don't know, brothers. Come on, what's the other one? Let's mention it on the mic, huh? What's the other one called? No, no, I'm not talking about the Sharia compliant ones. I'm talking about the ones that make it look like it's Islamic. <laughs> There's one with an M. Ajeeb. Huh? Yeah, I've said Muzmatch. I know Muzmatch. No. Muzmatch, Tinder, Minda. There was the other one, Islamic Finder. Is that what it's called? Single I, I, Muslims? I think Islamic Finder is the prayer time. Oh, one. no, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, think there's, I, meant, I meant the uh, there's, there's single one. Muslims. Hada, the single Muslims. Not Muslim Finder, that app. <laughs> single Muslims, that app. Brothers, all of these ones are like what? Tomato, tomorrow. <laughs> What's the difference between tomato and tomorrow? Is there much of a difference, guys? It's exactly the same. Read Iratatul Lahfan fi Masaid al Shaytan of Ibn al Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi, which talks about the tricks of the Shaytan. One of the tricks of the Shaytan is, right, changing the names of that which is haram. Alcohol has a different name today. Who can give me the different name? Spirit. Huh? 
Likewise, there was once upon a time when you had this, I put this in quotation marks, right? Muslim boy band, right? The something squad. We don't want to drop any names, right? What do they call it? Halal hip hop. Look at the oxymoron here. Halal hip hop. Billahi alaik. I can change the names of my brothers and my sisters as much as I want, but does that actually change the reality? No, it doesn't. Al asma'u la tughayyur al haqaiq. The names don't change the reality of something. It really doesn't. No matter what you end up calling it. Right? This is how the Muslims what? are trapped. Muzmach, right? Meaning Muslim match. Huh? Even if it has the name Islam in it, it doesn't really change the reality. All of these apps, my brothers and my sisters, are no different to Tinder and all of these other non-Muslim apps. And they all should be what? Thrown or put down the drain. However, you have alternatives. Again, it's one thing. Identifying the problem is another finding the solution. And by the way, I'm not getting paid to promote these apps at all. Uh, you have apps such as, I believe it's called Pure Matrimonial. Have you guys heard of it? There's another one called Sunnah Match. Sharia compliant. I know brothers and sisters that are on there. Good. Go on it. I think you should speak to your parents before you go on it though. Uh, speak to your parents before you go on it. Right? A potential spouse may come out of that. It is Sharia compliant. You have all of these youth today on these haram ones. Alhamdulillah, there are good ones as well. Right? So these are the alternatives, inshaAllah ta'ala. Jazakallah khair. Um, last time you were here, we spoke about student loans. I think I um, wanted to just follow up. Are student loans bay'ah mudaraba? Are student loans bay'ah mudaraba? Do you guys have any idea of what he's speaking about here? Bay' mudaraba. So basically, what's happened is student loans have been likened to bay' mudaraba, which is an Islamic based transaction. What is bay' mudaraba? Let's just say our brother, Sad Ubaid, he has the skills, he's a carpenter. I, the miskeen, just have the money. I don't know how to carry this work out, right? I put down 10,000 pounds to buy all of the equipment and whatever else is required. He puts in his work, his skills to the table. Or he puts that down onto the table. I brought the money, he's got the skills. Is this a legitimate type of partnership? Yes, without a shadow of a doubt. Perfect, great. It is lawful in the religion of Islam. Providing that we agree on a set amount of how much we will take from the profits. It could be 60, 40, 70, 30, or 50, 50. We have to agree, right? How much, how much we will both take once we make the profits. We're not talking about a set amount from the capital. Brothers and sisters, this is what? A haram money-making scheme. When someone says to you, put in 10,000 and I'll give you 7% from your capital. Right? A lot of these investment schemes, you find them putting this forward. You put down 10,000 10, pounds and I'll give you 7%. What's 7% of that every month? Huh? Yalla, jama'ah. 10%, uh, sorry, 7% of 10,000 pounds. 700 pounds. Shfikum, huh? It's basic maths. 700 pounds. As returns every month. Hada riba. Muharramun qat'an. It is haram. However, the percentage for the uh, share of profits needs to be from the profits itself. Like if we make, for example, 10,000 pounds, we're going to split it 70, 30, 40, 60, and so on and so forth. So this has actually been likened to student loans. Now let me ask you guys, right? For those who have maybe looked into it, is that really the same model? Student loans? When they give you now, for example, 10,000 pounds a year, is this really like bay' al-mudarab? No, it's not. 
Because at the time you have to agree how much you guys are going to split amongst yourself and this must be stipulated. Naam. So it's not that. <coughs> I wanted to ask, and I think just kind of taking it a little bit to a different route, but it's just a yes or no and I'll follow up. Can someone be possessed? Is this a thing? Yes, of course. Some people doubt the whole concept of, or the whole experience, and Allah obviously knows best. Well, you have the Quran, the Sunnah, and you have it happening amongst the people as well. Do you not see it? So, <laughs> so what's that reaction? What is it? If someone's possessed, what should they do? Him having a uh, emotional sit down or, or mother, what do you call it? Uh, so I think it's, w- w- the question comes up a lot, the element of possession, and there are some people that undermine it. But <laughs> but mess. mess is mentioned in the Quran, one becoming possessed. Also, Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, Inna Sultanu ala ladin yatawalluna. Even though it's not as sarih as the other, the shaitan only has authority over those who befriend him. Right? And those who commit shirk. How do you befriend the shaitan? By doing the things that he loves. Right? So jinn possession is real, my brothers and my sisters. It happens. People get possessed. When the shaitan takes over them, you start reading Quran on them and they start reacting. Do we not see that happening? That's jinn possession. No. So if someone's possessed hmm. Or they, they experience something Or they feel like that there is uh, An element of possession Or, or they, they, they are convinced What should they do? What is it that they should do? If someone is possessed What should they do? Yeah. <clears throat> I strongly suggest my brothers and my sisters And this is just a very quick answer Right? You have this self ruqya program that was translated by our brother Ustad Muhammad Timhambu. That was put together by a Sheikh Adil Muqbil, right? That's his name. The famous Raqi expert that resides uh, overseas in the kingdom. He's an expert in this. He's come to the UK multiple times as well. Self ruqya program. Type that into Google and it comes up. Yes, others may read on you which is inshallah ta'ala going to impact uh, positively. How are the three points that we need to take into consideration in order for this Ruqya session to be extremely effective? Sidq al-Raqi wa yaqeen al-Marqi wa sihat al-Marqi bihi. What does that mean? The one who's doing the Ruqya is someone who is doing it sincerely. If he's just coming to the house because he knows they're going to be providing ambula, huh? they're going to be providing food at the house, as some may do. Oh, there's going to be food after, let's go. And then they give him a mushaf and then he's reading. This guy wants food. It's not coming from his heart. He's not doing it sincerely. It's not going to be effective, my brothers and my sisters. Here, the sincerity part is very, very important. Sometimes we want to help, so we hire out a Raqi to read on some of our relatives. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to make sure that you choose someone who, inshallah ta'ala, has a good track record. Otherwise, you're going to be wasting a lot of money. Right? The one who the Ruqya is being read on, he must have yaqeen. Certainty that the cure is going to come from Allah. Sometimes you hear a brother who is possessed saying, no, well, I want you to do it. I want you specifically because I feel like, you know, you have something. Inshallah. Come. Huh? La, ya khwan. It's from what? Allah Azza wa Jal. You have to believe that. You becoming attached and connected to a human being, thinking that he may well be the, the, uh, the, the, the core reason as to why you might become cured. This is very dangerous as well, to have this kind of belief. Does that make sense? So have the tawak is Allah. No matter who comes, it is Allah as always going to cure me. Allah Azza wa Jal. Number three is Sihatul Marqi bi. That which is being read is what? Authentic. Right? Not some gibberish that is being read on you. Well, I remember I was speaking to my one of my neighbors, Juju. His name is Juju. That's what I call him. And he was saying to me, I attended, and then the guy is just making a lot of mistakes in his qira'a. Allah alam what the man's reading. And the people sitting there, they're thinking, Allahu Akbar, you know, Rukhi is being read on us. 
And he goes, it just, it just confused me. And then people are actually trusting this guy. No. So that's very, very important. So try to do the self ruqya, ruqya on yourself. Okay, ruqya on yourself. Type into Google self ruqya program. Muhammad Tim Humble, it comes up, that link. And then he translated something that inshallah ta'ala will be extremely positive. Okay, and impactful. Or maybe someone can find you someone to, and I will read the on you, bidnillah ta'ala. And number three, which is very, very important, my brothers and my sisters, try to wake up in the last third of the night. As we mentioned before, matradatun lidda, it removes any physical or spiritual sicknesses. Right? Try that. That's very, very impactful, inshallah ta'ala. Another very common thing that occurs and, uh, and a lot of the people are experiencing and dealing with is waswas, especially mm. when it comes to uh, the ibadat and uh, like probably the most common one is wudu. What advice do you have for people that are suffering from that? So wasawis in wudu? Yeah. That which is even more common is wasawis in a salah. What's always with regards to my faith, what's with my brothers and my sisters is the doubts that an individual now begins to experience when making wudu, right? Let me give you guys a principle. In dealing with wasawis, the fuqaha they say, lil You know when we make wudu, we have to make sure that we've done every part properly, right? You have to make sure that you've done it properly. And if you've missed out anything, double check, uh, and then wash it, right? It's very, very important and fundamental when it comes to the wudu. However, the person who's suffering from waswasa and may Allah Azza wa Jal cure them as they are many, we say to him, make wudu and get out of the toilet. If it means that someone drags you out, then let it be it. Wallahi, brother and sister, it broke my heart seeing some people go into the bathroom and they stay in there for hours. Some wake up before Fajr and they don't leave the bathroom except after sunrise. It's ibtila min Allah. Right? So, make wudu, cut out the whispers, get out of the toilet. That's how, inshallah ta'ala, you're going to what? Overcome these wasawis. When it comes to the wudu. Right? Then you also have my brothers and my sisters, that which relates to the salah. We have a hadith for this. Uthman ibn Abil As, radiallahu ta'ala, anhu, one time he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Inna shaytana. قد حال بيني وبين صلاتي وقراءتي يلبسها علي The shaytan has managed to get in between my recitation of the Quran and my prayer keeps irritating me it's causing me a lot of problems right what shall I do the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said ذاك شيطان يقال له خنزب this is a shaytan called khinzab Right? If you feel this, فَإِذَا حَسَسْتَهُ فَتَعَوَّذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنْهِ Seek refuge in Allah and say, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Right? وَتْفِلْ عَلَى يَسَارِكَ ثَلَاثَ And then also, dry spit on your left three times. Uh, not phlegm, huh? Uh, not that. We're talking about what? Dry spit to your left. So Uthman ibn Amil Aas, he says, فَفَعَلْتُ ذَلِكَ I did this. فَأَذْهَبَهُ اللَّهُ عَنِّي Allah has really removed it. Right? While you're inside of your salah, the shaitan comes and begins to give you doubt about you having lost your wudu. Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also taught us a very important principle. In the hadith it says, إِذَا وَجَدَ أَحَدُكُمْ فِي بَطْنِهِ شَيْئًا فَأَشْكَلَ عَلَيْهِ أَخَرَجَ مِنْهُ شَيْءٌ أَمْ لَا فَلَا يَخْرُجَنَّ مِنَ الْمَسْجِدِ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ صَوْتًا أَوْ يَجِدَ ر if you now begin to feel a disturbance in your salah, or should I say in your stomach, right? You begin to feel a disturbance. Sometimes you feel like that, right? Have I lost my wudu? Have I not? Right? Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, فَلَا يَخْرُجَنَّ مِنَ الْمَسْجِدِ He should not leave the salah. Here, masjid means salah. حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ صَوْتًا Up until he hears a sound. Or he finds what? A reeh. Smell. The principle here is, and it's a leading legal maxim. Something that has been established with certainty should not be dismissed due to some doubt that has arisen. What does that mean? Did you not just come out of the toilet and make wudu? 
You went, you made wudu, and then you started prayer. Has that been fulfilled with certainty, brothers and sisters? Certain, right? We just saw the guy walking out. I just made wudu now. Like me, before the start, I made wudu. I went into the salah, and then shaitan starts playing with me. Or oh, maybe you've lost it. I begin to feel that doubt. Should I give this doubt any consideration? No. Because the yaqeen will be bi shak. What has been established with certainty cannot be dismissed due to some doubt that has arisen. Does that make sense? And that's not just specific to the salah. It could be outside of the salah. You're doubting, Wallah, have I lost it? Have I not? You go back to the asal, which is you made wudu and that's what stands. Very, very handy principle, my brothers and my sisters. So many questions that I receive all the time pertaining to this. And then the third I think is, which is very, very common, having doubts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? One of the companions one time came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He said Inna najidu fi anfusina ma yata'adhamu ahaduna an yatakallam bih Indeed, O Messenger of Allah, we have these conversations with ourselves And, you know, it's, it's something that is really disturbing to mention Right? Or to be vocal about it We feel very uncomfortable to say it with our tongues That which we are speaking to ourselves about the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He said Wajitumu, This is what you found? He said yes The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He said This is The pure pinnacle of faith Or the essence of faith Right Sheikh Al-Islam Al-Islam Rahmatullahi Alayhi Ibn Taymiyyah Sheikh Al-Islam He says Right Al-Wasawisu Ta'aridu الوساوس تعرض لكل من التجا الى الله عز وجل these wasawis they come to anyone who turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanallah لكل من توجه الى الله عز وجل right and then he says فينبغي عليه upon him is to be firm to be patient and to occupy himself with dhikr with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Right. Whenever he feels that, straight away he starts remembering Allah Azza wa Jal. In another narration we are told, in another narration, my brothers and my sisters, we are told, that a shaitan comes to you and he says, Man kada? Who created this? Who created that? Right? Up until he says, Man rabbak? Who created your Lord? Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Whoever experiences this, then let him say, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وليانتهي and let him cut, him cut this out. Stop thinking about that. And turn towards the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Even Shaykh al-Sam Taymi was asked, إن اليهود والنصارى the Jews and the Christians, they claim that they don't suffer from waswasa. His response was, وما يفعل الشيطان ببيت الخراب what is the shaitan going to do to a heart that has already become corrupt? Why should the shaitan busy himself with them? He will come to people of iman, people with faith, always trying to pull you into a shirk and al kufr. Right? So, some of the solutions, my brothers and my sisters, is to rush into dhikr, to rush into reading Quran. Abu Huraira. رضي الله تعالى عنه as the reported by Darimi he says إن البيت لا يتسع على أهله the house becomes a comfort zone you know when right إن يقرأ فيه القرآن when the Quran is recited in it وتحضره الملائكة the ملائكة they come there وتهجره الشياطين and also the الشياطين they will run away from this kind of place that's when you recite the book of Allah عز وجل and then the opposite was mentioned as well. It becomes a place that is so uncomfortable. The shayateen, they come to this place. And the angels, they run away from it. Al-Dhikr, Al-Quran, my brothers and my sisters. Right? And also rush into prayer. Rush into prayer. Isn't this what the Prophet ﷺ used to do? He said, He would rush to the prayer. And that will ease, inshallah ta'ala, a lot of that which we are experiencing at the time. Um, are we done yet? Inshallah, we're going to go down to the last two questions. What minute is the game on, just to make sure that we...
Um, you mentioned something about Uswas when it comes to religion mm. and people doubting, questioning themselves when it comes to Islam and even Allah. Azza wa Jalla. And I think one question that often comes up is we see so much suffering around for Muslims. We see Muslims are targeted. We see Muslims are in a hard, uh, in, in difficult spots in a lot of the Muslim land b- being killed. Um, uh, starvations where whatever else that is suffering with that we ask Allah Azza to ease their affairs but why is Allah Azza allowing this to happen to the Muslims I spoke about this uh, in, a, in a lot more detail in the lecture that I've been delivering at the universities you can find it on my YouTube channel it's called Surat Yusuf put my name in Surat Yusuf right even when I came to Manchester not so long ago I kind of touched on this when speaking about statement of Allah Azza wa Jal وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِ لَتُنَبِّئَنَّهُمْ بِأَمْرِهِمْ هَذَا وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down revelation upon Ya'qub to allow the brothers of Yusuf to take him. Then you might ask yourself the question now, my brothers and my sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that the brothers of Yusuf are looking to get rid of Yusuf alayhi salatu wa sallam, right? They're trying to get rid of him. They hate him with a passion. They've got jealousy towards him. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows this. He is what? Al-Alim Al-Hakim. And these two names were mentioned three times alongside one another in Surah Yusuf. And that doesn't happen by chance or for no reason. Innahu huwa al-Alim al-Hakim. Allah is all-knowing and he is also all-wise. Right? You may ask yourself the question, why is Allah going to allow Ya'qub alayhi salatu wa sallam to suffer for decades and decades and decades because he went through a lot he lost his most beloved son right but Allah sent down revelation telling Ya'qub allow them to take him let them take him and it was the reason as to why he suffered right they, why why would Allah azawajal allow that brothers and sisters please watch that lecture inshallah ta'ala as we speak about all of the positive things that happened to you Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam and what he ended up becoming and then later on huh? then being in a poor place Allah azza wa jal took them to the palace as a family and that's where they resided everything my brothers and my sisters that happens happens for a reason even Shaykh al-Sam Taymi rahmatullahi alayhi says anna Allah azza wa jal la yakhluqu sharran mahda there isn't anything that Allah creates which is purely evil nothing Whatever you see, you, you, as a human being, as evil, it is subjective. What does that mean? You may look at something and think, oh, only evil is going to come out of this situation. Someone else will look at it and he will see the positivity in it. Right? Let me ask you guys a couple of questions. Some of our parents who came to the UK, what were the... uh, the lives that they were living at a time. Was it an easy one? Huh? You see a lot of brothers here, they come from, well their parents, they come from homes and lands that were struck with never ending wars. Agreed? When these wars were happening, did it ever cross their minds that maybe one day they will be walking around the streets of Manchester and their children would probably be sitting in a masjid and also going to university Attaining education, right? Which will give them better futures and so on and so forth. Do you think it ever crossed their mind? They're probably thinking at a time, Wallahi man, why is all of this happening to me? But it was that evil, that war, that was the reason why they will end up having better lives maybe in the future. Agreed? You know, my friend got shot a very long time ago. Shot in the head. I lived in London in an area where there was a generation of gangs, one after the other. You had the elders and then their youngers and then their youngers. And I think I was part of the fourth generation. It seemed like that we were going to have youngers as well and then they were going to have youngers. Yani, generation after generation, gangs. The parents were suffering. Wallahi, they were suffering. Mainly from Somali and Yemeni backgrounds. They suffered a lot in Camden, brothers and sisters. Up until this brother was shot in the head. 
When this brother was shot, no one done anything. I asked myself the question, where are all the brave hearts at? All these guys who will run from one area to another to come and defend you. No one done anything. That incident was the reason why many people, they go and study abroad. When you look at it from the apparent someone dying, oh, it's evil, right? According to how we think, sahih? Can you see now all of the positivity that came out of it? So many people, they left that area to go and study abroad. Someone to Yemen, someone to Egypt, someone to Medina. I remember at the time, my parents, they moved me out of London to Leicester. It was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. Everything happens for a reason. Whether you see it or not, how many times have we been in a position, my brothers and my sisters, where we really want something? I'll give the example that everyone can relate to. You want the sister so badly. Princess Charming, there's no one better than her. Sahih? And you try everything in your power. You will make the east come to the west and the west to the east just so you can have this wonderful, beautiful huh? lady. But then it doesn't happen. And to make things worse, your friend comes along huh? and he snatches her from under your nose. Ooh. Couldn't get any worse, huh? Years go by and Allah Azza wa Jal blesses you with a lady that the mind can't imagine. And this is when you say, oh, if that didn't happen, I wouldn't have this today. Does that not happen, brothers and sisters? At times, it doesn't make sense to us why this is happening. Later on, oh, subhanAllah, if that didn't happen, I wouldn't have this today. Think about that for a moment. And let that sink in. Everything happens for a reason. Right? Because of how limited our intellects are, my brothers and my sisters, we just don't see the good in things at the time. Later on, we might see it. This is why, leave these issues to Allah. He is the one that created everything, right? And He's all-knowing. If you now invent this new phone, my brothers and my sisters, you invented this new phone. And someone else comes along and he says, you, you're the owner, right? No, 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 no. This is not how you do things and it should be done like that. How would you feel? Who are you, you know? To tell me what is right and what is wrong, how to use the phone that I invented, that I created. You're more knowing because you are the creator of that. Allah Azza wa Jal created everything so perfectly. Right? With his wisdom. And everything that he chooses to happen, happens for a reason, whether you see it or not. Naam. Barakallahu uh, The final question I wanted to ask is, how do you find a dunya, a balance between your dunya and your akhirah? That's a very broad question. Very broad. Can you make that a little bit more specific? So the example that someone gave was maintaining your prayers on time without it affecting work and study. Or for I think example, we kind of spoke about that, right? That when I wake up, my number one priority is what my salah. Everything revolves around the salah. You know the righteous, the way they speak is, let's do this after dhuhr. Let's do this before dhuhr. Let's do this after maghrib and before isha. Everything else is structured around the prayer. We, as human beings, need to have timetables and schedules. If you just wake up and you just go with whatever happens, you're just gonna, going to be all over the place. Your salawah is your number one priority. Everything happens around it. dunya mal'una. Mal'unun ma fiha. This dunya is cursed, my brothers and sisters. Everything in it is cursed, except a few things. Number one, the dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. Wa'aliman aw muta'allima. The one who is an alim, a scholar, and the one who learns his religion. Right? I am a disbeliever in someone saying I don't have time. I'm a disbeliever in that. Huh? I don't believe that this is something, my brothers and my sisters, right? That is actually possible because everyone can find time for that which is most important to him. If it means that you sacrifice maybe an hour of your sleep or an hour of your playing around FIFA or watching the football game or whatever have you, and let it be it. You will find time. Also, you may want to check your screen time. For those who have Apple, I don't know about Samsung. Huh? I've got nothing to do with it. But Apple, I'm a loyal Apple fan for many years, maybe over a decade. It tells you the screen time, brothers and sisters. It may well be that you have to cut certain things off in order for you to find time. Now, 
May Allah Azza wa Jal bless every single one of you. Is that it? Or a few few thani? Nasid wa hathir. I think it was the question about um, with Medina University being so competitive, what alternatives are there for people that are seeking to to, to take a journey on Talab al-Ain? What are some of the alternatives to Medina College? Uh, Medina University? No. I was going to say alternative to Medina College. Medina College in South London, you can maybe go there, but I think it's very far for a lot of you guys. Mashallah, you guys have a lot of programs here in Manchester. Right? I think earlier we were speaking about Furqan College, right? Um, Furqan College, they have Arabic now as well. Brothers and sisters, we have to start here. And I think when Sheikh Abu Sama was here and Sheikh Muhammad Ali, when we had that panel discussion, they were speaking about this, that you have to start here. If you really want Al Medina, show Allah Azza wa Jalla that you are what? Uh, suitable for it by starting from now. Okay? You have programs that the different tulab al-ilm are carrying out in the masjid and outside of the masjid. You will find it. I'm sure if you speak to the brothers, they will connect you, bi ta'ala. Right? So start here, bi ta'ala. Also, you have online courses. Like, I'm a teacher on Knowledge College. Right? It's an online uh, course. It's like a one year where you go through the essentials. Essentials, hadith, fiqh, sirah, tawheed, and so on and so forth. Gives you the basics of what you are in need of. So there are also these online courses that you will find, inshallah ta'ala. Does that make sense? Also, earlier we forgot to speak about the issue of the apprenticeships. We just uh, came back from a Japanese pancake shop. They invited us and they insisted we come, and may Allah bless them. They really hosted us as their guests. Everything was free, but I think you guys would have to pay for it because you live in Manchester. And, uh, and the brother, subhanAllah, he showed me an alternative to, um, we were speaking about the whole university stuff. They have these, well, it's not them, they're just the link between the people who are interested and also the government. Government funding for apprenticeships that also come with a degree, صح? Yeah. You do apprenticeship, you work, you learn the trade, and you're doing your degree at the same time without having to take a loan. It's another alternative. By the way, remember I said last time, I'm not saying that it's haram, halal, and whatever have you. That's not my place. However, what I can do is provide alternatives and apprenticeships are without a shadow of a doubt. A wonderful alternative that so many people have benefited from. Even Ibrahim was currently in Medina. Sahih, ya Sheikh Umar. Ibrahim, from, from here, I think what, was it engineering? It was engineering apprenticeship. And he was working, he was earning ridiculous money. And we used to make jokes about his wage. He said, you need to fund the da'wah soon. Huh? Allahumma barik, was it? And now he's in Al-Medina. So he was doing apprenticeship on a very high wage. Now he's going to Al-Medina. So there are alternatives without a shadow of a doubt. I think, was it called Halal Alternative, if I'm not mistaken? It's called Halal Alternatives on Instagram. You type in Halal Alternatives, it has like these blue images and... Is it called that? Yeah. Yeah, Halal Alternatives on Instagram. Barakallahu feek, Shaykh. May Allah reward you for your time and bless you. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here again at the masjid. And uh, maybe, inshallah, we'll have you in the near future. And if Allah Azza wills, you move to Manchester and you do your hijrah. He started from London to Leicester. I think now it's time you upgrade. So you're more than welcome here at your masjid. Brothers, can I make a request? Well, I would love to meet every single one of you, kiss you and hug you and whatever have you. Right, my wife is actually still in hospital. She gave birth two days ago, and I was so close to cancelling this program, but I know Sheikh Muhammad Ali would have slaughtered me. Right, she's still in hospital, and my because my there was a bit of a complication with my newborn. Right, and I have to show off. I really do, and my daughter now is being looked after by someone else. My second daughter, or well, the first, you know, the older one, Taymiyyah. huh? Uh, so I'm really going to have to show off. I know there's always brothers that have questions after. I don't know why they don't ask it, but they always ask it at the end. Uh, if we can do it, inshallah, next time, I will be coming back on the 1st of January, right? 31st, is it? Oh, sorry, I'm not allowed to uh, so, expose the dates. So the Sheikh is giving it away, so we may as well give an exclusive, inshallah, that the Al-Furqan, Masjid Furqan Winter Conference is coming up, inshallah. 
on the 31st of December and the 1st of January. Uh, the post and the details are going to be released over the next few days. Uh, there's going to be a few speakers. I can, can you guys guess the first one? <laughs> Just check in if you're paying attention. Jazakallah yeah. khair for listening. So inshallah ta'ala, when I come then, you know, I'll be there for the whole day. And I'm teaching a book as well and some other lectures. We're going to go through feminism part two as well. <laughs> huh? We went through part one. Alhamdulillah, it's blown up. I've had feminists message me saying that they've repented to Allah. Allah. Huh? The video has over 100,000 views on my channel. Oh. Alhamdulillah. So we're going to do part two now, speaking about qiwama, the man being the maintainer and the provider and being the person of authority in the house, which is an ayah that has been rejected and negated by some of our sisters. May Allah forgive them. Amen. Part two, bi ta'ala, in a lot more detail. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can I just emphasize, inshallah, what the Shaykh requested? Please, please, just give him, inshallah, safe passage out of the masjid. Wallahi, bar brothers, and, wallahi, uh, I want to kiss all of your heads uh, and hug you all. But I'm so mentally tired, I haven't slept much, and I have to rush back and pick up my daughter. Allah yahfadhukum. Yeah. Zakum Nakhir.